Good morning and welcome to our uh Nebraska what language? What? Okay, let's uh can we mute? <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to join us on a Saturday for the uh NDE what language Nyla and CLTA sick take twelve uh guest speaker series. Today we have Sarah with us. And um, Daniel Filcher, Daniel Filcher is co-hosting with me. She is the uh, Nebraska International. She is the president elect from Nebraska International Language Association. And Sarah is our guest speaker today. And she is going to talk about brain breaks. It's I'm super excited about this because I know how it how important it is to keep keep students engaged and also not to, you know, not too tired, I have to say, in a classroom. So brain breaks really is really, really helpful. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Sarah Hopper. I am a New York uh, teacher. I teach French and Spanish currently at Corning Payne Post High School. I'm currently um, teaching in the MYP program of an IB school in the 10th grade, but I have experience from fifth grade all the way to college level um, courses and IB courses at the upper level. So all of these brain breaks, I think will be uh, great for a variety of levels. So we're gonna talk about the brain breaks and please feel free to ask questions as the activities are happening in the chat and I'll be glad to answer them as they go. All right, so here is a copy of my presentation. I'll give you a minute while I introduce myself. So there's a website, uh, so you can have a copy of this. So you have all the materials that you need to start up. There's also the QR code, so feel free to use that if you need that. Um, so I have been teaching, this is my 22nd year of teaching. Um, I've taught, like I said, all levels from fifth through 12th grade. I um, love to have fun with my students. Um, I, I really enjoy culture and sharing a lot of, these things. So a lot of these brain breaks um, are things that will incorporate a lot of that for you. Okay, so why why do we do them? So we do them for a lot of reasons. So you have to remember that it's been proven that brain breaks will improve cognitive function. They help the kids with social emotional growth. Um, students actually will create bonds and community through brain breaks. So we have so many kids who go through school and they have no connection. They may not actually really have friends, but these brain breaks can provide that um, social emotional connection for them. They reduce stress and anxiety in the classroom. So that effective filter that we're all fighting against for that confidence to try the foreign language is going to go down with some of these brain breaks. And they bring the fun back in the classroom, not just for them, but for you too. It's important you have fun with your students too. We have to remember uh, our job is actually a lot of fun um, and you will remember that through some of these brain breaks. Um, so how often? That's a, a question you often get. It all depends on the age and the behavior or needs of your group. Um, I have taught on the block schedule before, 80 minutes. I would do three of those probably a day. They say the golden rule is like the students have a, about their age and attention span. However, sometimes you have a group and they don't even have that. I mean, it might be 15, but not have 15 minutes of attention. So you can use this as a transition when you're switching activities. Um, you can do one every 15 to 20 minutes, or you could read the room. The whole room looks like they're falling asleep or everybody's chatting and not doing what you want them to, it's a good time to have one at that moment. Um, and sometimes just I start the class off with one. Let's get them in my classroom. Let's wake them up a little. And that can be fun too. So you, you can use them pretty much anytime you want. Not all of these are going to be done in the target language, but you could always adapt. So that's something um, that you have to remember. If you spend three minutes not in the target language, but you're getting... 40 minutes of instruction out of your students, that three minutes is probably so worth it. Or maybe your group can handle the target language too. So you can adapt. Like if it's a lower level and you don't think they can do it in the uh, target language, just adapt that. Okay, so I'm gonna start showing you some brain breaks. Um, so we'll start with quite a few in just a second. But I also want to remind you that I have a bunch of different types of brain breaks. And that's because we have to remember we have a diverse group of students and there's introverted and extroverted students. You have neurodiverse students. 
You have students who have to move to learn, a lot of kinesthetic learners. You have kids who are very artistic and they like to be creative. And you also have sometimes students with physical limitations. So I have adapted, I have had a student in a wheelchair with very limited arm range. I still found a way to try to incorporate them in all of these brain breaks. Um, there are adaptations. So all these are things to keep in mind. And please don't feel like you have to be different. You can be yourself. Uh, if this, if you don't feel like you have, um, you know, not everybody is a dance on the table type of teacher. Not everybody wants to sing. I, I personally don't sing karaoke to my students. They appreciate that. I don't, um, but to each his own, right? So there's just a lot of ideas. So some are going to be for you and some may not, but they're ideas that you could use down the road if you choose. Okay, so our first one is called Wipeout. So you could either have just chairs if you happen to be deskless, you could do floor space, or you could put the desks in the room in a circle formation so that they could still get up and down. So you call it a statement in the target language. And if that matches you, you get up and have to find a new seat. And then every once in a while you say Wipeout and everybody needs to find a new seat. So it's based on things they may have in common. You could completely do this in the target language if they were able to understand you. So like, for example, you have blue eyes. So everyone with blue eyes would get up. And while I'm getting up, I can see the other people in the room with blue eyes, or I can see the people who have a dog. You have a dog. So in a sense, you're creating like a little social emotional learning. I'm getting up, I'm really, oh, my friend has a dog. They ask them what kind of dog they have later. Um, so these are type of things. You'll like Coke more than Pepsi. You like to dance. You've been to a concert, you prefer Burger King over McDonald's, you go to a restaurant one time a week. So you could use a variety of things. It could be based on what you're studying, if you want, like in the unit you're doing, or random. The only thing I would suggest just to not cause um, political problems or discomfort for your students is just to avoid gender. Um, when I first did this activity years ago, you know, I'd be like, if you're a boy, get out of your seat. I don't do that anymore so much because I teach high school. And you've got a lot of um, questioning kids, I'll say, and LGBTQ kids, and some people just don't want to choose either way. So I'd avoid gender, but all the other things are great ideas. Kind of gets the class up, you do it for a few minutes, uh, get them out of their seats, running around, and mostly they'll be having a good time. Um, the Kushval Challenge. So if you're a young teacher, some of my young teachers may not know what a Kushbal is. These are at Walmart, and that's the brand name. It's called a Kushbal. So the Kushbal, and then I bought a kitchen timer. I use this all the time in the classroom, and it's your best friend. So the Kush timer, I will. I basically set a class challenge, and I did this after the first week of the school this year. So I had three rules for the students. I said, one, everybody in the room has to touch the Kushbal. Two, uh, no one may talk when the ball is moving. And three, if the ball drops, we have to start again. And I tell them they're competing against the other classes. We start this like, on a, it's like a one week activity. So on the first day, the students are just tossing it back and forth. Actually, it takes them a long time, believe it or not, to not, to not catch it because they can't speak to each other. So some of them don't pay attention. And then we start over and we talk about how not to overreact if someone drops it and we have to start again. So we every time we fail, we stop. We are allowed to talk and strategize before it begins. So it starts off, my students are like 23, 24 seconds. Um, by the end of the week, they're at one second because they start to strategize and figure it out. And eventually, uh, most classes will discover if they all just touch the kushbal in one second, we get down to like 0.01. They all like reach in together and touch the kushbal. So it's kind of a fun challenge. So what I do is I have five classes so every class gets their highest score. So every day they get to like have two practices. So by the end of the week, um, we divide by how many numbers. So like if let's say a class this time is 0.01 and there's 23 students, that's how fast per person. So that's how they win. So I bought some croissants. It happened to be a French class that one. So I bought them some croissants, uh, but it's very fun. Good little warm up to get to know each other. You can um, also do additional couche ball challenges, add two balls three if you have a really determined class, but sometimes just throwing around a koosh ball is fun. And of course it doesn't hurt anyone if it gets hit. I can tell you because I've even been hit by it because sometimes when we can't talk that whole part. Okay, fidget talking. So you guys remember these, they were like banned in elementary school and the kids still love them, believe it or not. So they, I bought a, a set, they were about $15 in Amazon, but there are virtual fidgets you can find um, online, which I have the link for that on the bottom. So what you do is have them partner up 
then they spin the spinner and they have to talk about whatever uh, whatever you want them to talk about till the spinner stops. So at the low level, you might have them like listing foods they can remember or sports. Mid levels, maybe they have to tell you about their family and sentences, tell you about their school. When you get in the more advanced level, you can have them listing environmental problems while it spins, or you can have them talking about like, should cell phones be allowed in school, like a mini conversation. So it's kind of just fun and the fidget just creates a little bit of activity for it. Good speaking activity. My students love holding these though, and they get really into it. When you take them back, they're kind of sad. So it works well. Okay, it's in the bag. Here's another one. <laughs> so you kind of draw a big circle. You see the three circles there on the right. Hopefully you can see them. Uh, so you have a big circle and you have a category that you've decided ahead of time. Like for example, things that are red, things that use batteries. It could be things that um, are poison, whatever you choose. So the kids start guessing ideas. Um, usually I give like a little hint, like it's gonna be a food, something like that. Cause you do need to get them kind of satisfied. So if it meets the criteria of my category, it goes inside the inner circle. If it doesn't, I put on the outside. So the kids continue to guess and guess and guess till they figure out the category. So it's kind of just a fun game you can play. Um, you could you can completely do that in the target language if you're if the students are capable, or you can just take a few minutes and do this in English at the lower levels if you need to. All right, this one's called Guess the Topic. Um, so like there are English examples I'm going to show you right now. But feel free to, you can obviously, once you get the hang of it, you can make them in the target language too. But there's a bunch already made right here. So like basically you would say to your students, like eyes, shoes, twins, glasses, scissors, earrings. And they have to figure out uh, what is the category. So if they got it right, things that come in pairs. So there's different, th so that, again, there's a bunch of examples on this page that you can use if you wanted to do it in English or you just adapt it to your language. Servers, tables, menus, plates, food, chefs, things at a restaurant, you know, so a bunch of ideas there. So you can kind of get them uh, thinking and categorizing and maybe they can even, if you get them good enough, they can make some clues. You can have them make a couple cards for the game too. Okay, next one. Um, I don't know if any of you played this game when you were a kid, but there's like this, it's the memory game. So you had like a tray of objects. You put all the objects on it and, and someone comes out and shows everybody all the objects and you take one away. So there is the tray. You could still go with the tray if you choose, or you can kind of do Kim's game. So Kim's game is all the objects. They have so many time to memorize it. And then after they memorize it, they have to write down what they remember. So here's a video. It's kind of like, I'll just play a, a minute or two of it. Can you hear my volume? No, sorry. For some reason, they can't always play, but it's okay. It's not volume needed, but there they memorize this. Uh, this is what they have to memorize. So then they watch this for 45 seconds. The video goes for 45 seconds. And then at the end, they ask them to write down the, what, done everything they want. Then they start taking them away and they have to figure out which one is missing. So it's kind of fun because I do think this has a foreign language purpose. So I don't know if any of you ever teach your students to peg to remember things, but pegging is a memory tool. So you can like often the kids that do the best, they remember there's a dog, there's a dog house, right? So if they can associate the words, then they're more likely to remember. So that's kind of like a fun memory game. All right, then uh, this is called body part draw pass. So I do this with my class and I put them all in a big circle. Um, you can just move the desk into a circle so it's easy to pass the paper. Everybody gets a blank piece of paper on their desk. You have them write their initials on like the bottom right corner. Then have them flip the paper so it's not on the bottom right corner. So you can't see the initials. Then we move the paper in like a certain pattern, like clockwise or counterclockwise. And the students will pass the paper around and they're going to draw the body part that you tell them to draw in the language but I'm intentionally random. So maybe the first person's drawing the nose, then we move it to the right, and now the next person has to draw the hair. There's no face yet. So it's like a lot of fun. So by the, the whole, you do have to instruct your students to make sure they leave room for it to be a person, not make the feet the whole page, ideally. 
Um, so in the end, you create a fun alien or monster. So you could go as far as like creating stories about your mark monster, but my students love this. Um, so there's like an example, it comes out kind of like that, uh, pretty yeah. funny. I do do color coded <laughs> markers because sometimes you have immature uh, kids who like to add, you know, private parts in. So I do do intentionally, uh, like I know who has the red markers, like two kids with red markers. So if there ends up being a, a penis on it, I can track it down very quickly because there's two kids with red markers. So, and then I have the last person before it gets passed back to the person. So you end up giving them back their paper, their initial paper in the end, and they love it. They think it's hilarious what their drawing became because that becomes their drawing. But um, the last person I have make connect everything that isn't connected. I also have them uh, fix anything. Like, so if anything needs to be covered at a bikini top or whatever you need to do before it goes back to the person. The kids really enjoy this. They take these home with them. Uh, they love if I leave them up in the classroom for a few days. I think they're hilarious. And that's, I mean, I'm talking 15, 16 year olds love it. So I know the little kid and I've used it with younger kids too. And they love it too. Okay, cell phones. Um, my school is not a cell phone blocking school. They definitely have them. So you might as well let them use it for a minute. So you give them one minute to find a photo that they're willing to share on their phone with the partner. And then they get to share with their partner about their picture. Like, here's a picture of me at my birthday party. I just turned 16. And then the other person like, oh, here's my dog. Isn't it adorable? So you ha they have some type of conversation about the picture. And you're creating like a little emotional connection and gives them just a second of fun. Then of course you do train them that they have to put the phone away after. You could also have them share their favorite song or an app for a variation and talk about it. Could be good for the tech unit, but also could be good just for like a quick uh, brain break. Uh, this one's called circumlocution bingo. You place a picture of screen of random objects, words you know your students don't know, like things that are hard to say, hard to translate. So the students need to describe the item until their partner guesses. You can also play as a whole class if you want. So here I've set up a circumlocution bingo board. These are words I think probably realistic the kids would have a hard time explaining. So you teach them those circumlocution skills. That's the beauty of it so that they, they don't need to know it's a hole puncher. They, they need to know how to say it's an object. It's an object that's metal. It's an object that is used by teachers, you know, that type of circumlocution vocabulary. So basically, if it was my turn, I would say, and I, this you could do this as a teacher too and let the kids play. I could be like, well, it's round, uh, it's sticky, it's gray, it's used in construction. And then probably most people would figure out it's the duct tape. So you can do this with a variety of items. So that can be kind of neat so that you can have, um, them trained to the circumlocution skills. And then it gives them confidence too when they don't know a word in the language, they're, they're gaining those skills to try to work around it. Just like, honestly, and I don't know about you, but I speak three languages and sometimes I forget English and I have to use circumlocution. So it'll be like, oh, you know what I'm talking about that thing, you know? So you would, it's a good skill to have. Okay, the next activity is called reverse drawings. So, you have one person look away from the board. You have two partners, partner A and partner B. So let's say partner B is not gonna is gonna look away and partner A gets to see my board. So on my board, I'm gonna post a picture of an object, a person, a fruit, whatever I wanna post. And now I have to give directions in the target language for my partner to draw this. Um, so I did a lot, a big unit on personal uh, descriptions. So the kids had to learn you know, like how to say, you know, they have a long face, a, a short nose, it's round, you know, all those details. So then you have them uh, do that. So like, for example, partner B is looking away and partner A would describe this. And then in the end, you let them see how close they got. Usually they're not really that close. So it's kind of funny, but sometimes they're kind of close. And they're like, oh, I got it. You know, so it the better details they give, the closer it's going to look. Another now, um, the next game is Celebrity Baby Fun. So I use in my classroom actually some baby shower type games, but they're actually kind of fun. And the, the kids do, for the most part, are into celebrities. They're into the YouTubers. They're into all that stuff. So I don't know. I meet them where they're at. I know that they're into this stuff. And sometimes I'll find out somebody's a fan. I'll make sure I include them in, in my activities too. 
So this is a baby picture of a celebrity. So I'll let you guys take a guess. You can throw them in the chat if Crystal or Danielle would share out some guesses. So who do you think this is? Anybody want to guess? It's a famous celebrity and it's a baby. I'll give a hint. It's pre-plastic surgery. <laughs> Maybe that'll help. <laughs> So it was Kim Kardashian. I don't know if anybody got that. But that was Kim Kardashian. <laughs> okay, here's the next one. Um, this one, maybe you guys will know who this is. So this one is, your students know, from One Direction, Harry Styles. <laughs> so <laughs> that's Harry Styles. We're yeah, they got it in a chat. All right, bravo, good job. So we're going for the younger one, the younger girl. Let's see if some people have some guesses. So if you guess Jennifer Aniston, you are right. Good. Yeah. Here's one. She's been in the news a lot lately. That is Britney Spears. Stacy got it. Good job, Stacy. Here's this one. I think is a give me, but my students always get this one. They have a good time pretending. And if your kids aren't really good at it, you can give them multiple choice on the side. Sometimes you have to do that if you think your kids are a little weak in it. So that's LeBron James. Um, I also purchased a game. I didn't. Per it's called What the Face. I know it sounds weird. It's called What the Face, but it has all these picture cards. And I play the games with these two. So I purchased it just for the print. It has a bunch of cards in it. You will want to, if you buy it, I'll be honest, there's a couple you got to pull. There's one man smoking and I think a, a naked dwarf in a bathtub. I pulled those, but the rest are fine. So they're profile pictures of people. And I use them for like, guess who you can like, you have enough actually for a full class set to give each class, like each student, like 220, um, cards per partnership and they could send them out and play guess who with them and flip them over as they eliminate and play with a partner or describe with those as well so that was barely I can't remember when I bought it but it's called what the face so you can look it up it was a nice game you could also get parents to send in the kids baby pictures obviously it would be somewhat inclusive obviously there might be some kids without baby pictures but that could be fun you could also maybe put the faculty pictures in so just for a twist if you wanted to personalize the activity a little um, my son's teacher had us uh, submit baby pictures this year. So I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, this one is Guess the Celebrity, a blurry face activity. So I love BuzzFeed. I use it a lot for picture talks, but um, if I can scroll, if I can figure out. Okay, so like you get the picture and then you have to guess which one it is. So if you guessed correctly, it is Selena Gomez, right? So like kind of the blurred face and the kids have to know who it is. So that's kind of fun. You could even send the kids to the website and have them play with a partner so they can actually click on it and find out for themselves. Or you could play as a class, completely up to you. So that one is fun. This one is um, available on the, on the internet. I found it and it's a uh, guess the baby, but it has the choices on the side. So they can, you can have them with a partner, sit down and try to match who's who, how many they can get right. So they can have fun. And if you want to add the target language and add more like physical description, you know, you could go into and describe each celebrity one by one. Like Selena Gomez is wearing a blue shirt and they could go on the bingo board and find which one she was or different things. So if you wanted to use physical description, vocab and keep in the target language, you could do that too. So my students for the most part are really into celebrities and they enjoy this activity a lot. This is one called Guess the Celebrity Eyes. So there's a free one on BuzzFeed right there on that link. But it is, I think it was a dollar. I think I paid a dollar for it. And I, I have one that's Guess the Celebrity Eyes from Teachers Pay Teachers. And that one I think has two different editions. There's like 50. And obviously I don't play the whole game in one class. I break it up. There's 40, 50 clues. We might do three today, three another time. You know, you just have to remember like, okay, I was on number three. I was on number four. So, um, so anyone want to guess the eyes of this one? Does anyone know who that is? So if you guess Angelina Jolie, you are correct. There, that one, that one's really popular right now. I know your students would get this. <laughs> so if you guess Taylor Swift, 
you're allowed back in the classroom, right? Because <laughs> your students are obsessed. This one here is Leonardo DiCaprio. So that's kind of fun. This one's guess the baby animal. So you can have like a lot of fun with your students. So these guessing games though, the kids really do actually enjoy. Uh, this one goes to this uh, link. There are a couple different activities on here. So you can play the guess the baby animal quiz. So they look at it and they have to figure out what animal they think it is. So that's kind of can be fun. Uh, let's see if I can scroll that over a second. X out of it, go back, there we go. So they can go through and guess the animals. There's also a few other games on there that might work on that link too. This one's guess the sound. So you could have the whole class actually shut their eyes for it, or you can see what they what they could guess. So since you can't really hear the audio, I'll just show you like it plays, like this one's a, that one's like a bowling strike. So they hear it and then they have to guess. So you wanna hear it and then pause it while they guess what it is. And then there are a variety of different common sounds. So that one can kind of be good um, to play. Guess the animal. So the animals make noises and you have to guess what animals making the noise. So like the peacock's really fun. I don't know if you guys have heard what a peacock sounds like or things like that. There's just a bunch of interesting animals and then they have to guess. Uh, so that can be kind of fun. Like you have a lion, a goose, there's a goose. You know, there's a bunch of different animals on there. This one's guess the Disney voice. So if you have like Disney fans in your classroom, uh, so you hear the audio of the Disney character and then you have to try to guess what it is. You get about 20 seconds of listening to it and then they give you about 20 seconds think time and then you have to guess who it is. So kids who like Disney. This one's famous voices. So you hear someone speaking, a celebrity and have to figure out who you think it is. Some of them are easier than others. And of course our students may not know all of them, but you could pick some that you think would be a hit with your student. Um, this one's called silent lineup. So the students are not allowed to speak, um, but you give them a, a category. So I'd, I'd put it like on a sign and tell them that they're now lining up by hair length. They cannot say a word. They now have to use just body language to figure out who's the shortest, who's the longest. They have to line themselves up in the perfect order of hair length. Or you could pick shoe size or, you know, Things that are like unique or, you know, could be, I don't know, student ID numbers, whatever you choose. So you can really challenge them. And then they have to figure out how to get themselves into the line the correct way without using words. So they can point to each other, you know, you go left, you go right, compare height, <laughs> you know, they're kind of funny. So that one's fun. And it's quiet while they do it, of course. These are puzzles. So there's like some of our kids really enjoy puzzles and thinking logically. So this one would be like, you have to um, find all the faces that you can see in the picture. So you might post it, you could either print it out and give it to each partnership so they can really hone in on what they see, or you can just post it on the board and have the kids count how many they see. So those can be kind of fun, these type of puzzles. Uh, how many triangles do you see? So I'll give you guys a chance to try how many you think you count. So the, the real number is, I can't even remember, it's pretty high. But like, if you look at all the triangles in there, the kids could have some fun with this. And there are some kids who have that logical brain who actually enjoy like the math type stuff. So I do try to have variety. Um, it's not my personal love, but I know some of my students, it's their thing. So I do try to do that as well. So there's how many triangles do you see? Uh, how many eights do you see? There's just a lot of stuff. If you go out on Pinterest for like to these type of puzzles, you can find so many ideas. Gets the kids talking, gives them a minute of something to, to do. How many animals do you see? So in this image, there are a bunch of animals hidden. So if you have if you have a really good image of it, I think there's like 48 in, animals in here. So you could even give that on the paper and give them a marker and let them circle them. That might be kind of kind of fun to challenge. And then like I don't know if you found. 20, you know, you're you're a, a novice. If you found 48, you're an expert type of thing. Not very many will probably find all 48. Um, I like this activity, it's fun. Uh, so if you go on the internet, you can find little eye exam charts and you print them off and make sure there's different ones. And then exactly, Daniel's got it. And then you give yourself the eye exam, but you make the kids say the alphabet in the target language. 
So they are practicing the alphabet. And of course they have to stand 10 feet back and their partner's judging their eyesight. And then they have, you know, have them switch eyes. Uh, they have a good time doing this one. And often the kids with glasses will take them off because they think it's actually more fun to not be right. And then they have to try to say all the letters. So good way to review the alphabet, kind of a fun activity. Uh, this one is uh, the brain breaks. Uh, so this one happens to be in Spanish, but basically the kids have to make a choice and then they have to do a, a calisthenic activity for the choice they made. So, I mean, if you're just trying to, like you have a chatty group that needs to move, I, I, like here's, so you get 10 seconds to choose between two options and then you get 20 seconds. So you have to do the activity. So I'll just show you like the first one. So you have to choose if you want to be a superhero or a magi. And then when it's your turn, you have to choose one of these exercises. So if you want to do the magi, you do the activity on the right. If you want to be the superhero, you have to do the what's on the left. So that one can be fun. And they are available in a variety of target languages. There's a French version. Um, there are English versions out there too. Here is a would you rather for food. So you could, what I sometimes do is I throw some tape down in the middle of the room and make the kids cross the line. Like what side, this or that. And then it's kind of fun because like the kids are like, oh yeah, I'm a Takis person. Oh, I'm, oh no, Flamin' Hot Cheetos. So when you uh, play this one, they have to make choices. So like, then they have to cross the line to decide which one they want to eat. So it's would you rather, but kind of with a twist because you're getting a moving by allowing the, them to cross the line. And then again, I'm finding out my friends, two of my friends like nuggets, or maybe I'm the only person liking onion, onion rings on the, on the right. So it's a variety of foods. Uh, that one can be fun as well. There's another one. This is Lena and Lisa, and they apparently have different food preferences. So you cross the line based on what you like. So they have like, so you had to choose one of the cookies. They both created these two, they're sisters and they both bake. So you can have them like pick aesthetically which one would they go to, can be fun too. The memory test. So this is a two minute memory test where they actually test their memory. So that one's kind of fun too. It, it like shows certain things and they have to see what they remember. So some of them don't have the greatest memory but they try real hard. So that can be fun. So when you watch the, like, so here's the, so you have this memory test, you have to watch it, and then they're going to take one away. And I have to know what they took away. And as it progresses, they'll take more away. So two or three will go away and things. So you, it's two minutes long, but that one's kind of interesting. Yeah, but, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. Kim sure. asked, it, could you recommend some websites for resources for their picture puzzles? The picture puzzles? Um, I, I generally find them on Pinterest or sometimes they actually come up on my own Facebook feed and I'll seal them and take them to the classroom. They get thrown around a lot. But if you go on Pinterest and you search um, like brain games or uh, puzzles, brain puzzles, word puzzles, things like that. They do image puzzles, optical illusions, sometimes is a good search. You can find a lot of things. This one is called the high low card challenge. So when it's their turn, I have a giant poker set. I bought on Amazon, it's like giant. And I use the giant set. It's hard to shuffle, I'll be honest, but <laughs> I pull the cards. So you're gonna go around the room to each kid and each kids have to decide if it's higher or lower. And you're gonna try to see how far in the class you can get. I did find this link so I could quickly show you so we can play. So like, all right, so Crystal, here's the card, the nine. Do you think the next one's higher or lower? Lower. <laughs> all right, she wins, she, the game keeps going. All right, Danielle, higher or lower? Oh, I'm gonna go for, my instinct is telling me lower. Oh, we'd start again. <laughs> then we'd start the next person. So we just see how far we can get across the room. And I do count, usually you have to decide ahead of time if ACE is going to be high or low. So you can use the same link if you'd like it. Um, it's randomcards.com. It has a shuffled deck on it if you don't want to buy cards at all. But my kids do kind of enjoy my giant cards because they can see it as well. I play reading poker with that too, if anybody plays that activity. 
This one's called marker cap race. So how many, I'm assuming people probably have those little dry erase boards. They were really big, you know, and we all got the shower boards made. So this is a good way to use it. So you, every kid needs a marker and then just one white little whiteboard between them. Or if you have whiteboards all over your room, give them each a little spot. So they make a T-chart, okay? So the left side is the left partner spot. The right side is the right partner side. Then I say the word in English and make them write it in the target language. And then, so they quickly try to write it in the target language. Then they have to put the cap on the marker and drop the marker. Whoever's marker hits the ground first is the winner of that round. So then that part, left partner gets one point. Okay, next right partner wins. So they tally against each other. I usually set a timer for like three minutes and have them play. And then they tally their points, um, how many they get. You could switch it up and uh, have it be uh, a list item, or you could describe something in your target language and make them guess it and have to write it correctly. So it's kind of a fun one, uh, competing against the partner and then the marker. I will say um, you have to train them to make sure the markers go back um, so that they don't break the markers, but it's overall a highly enjoyable and competitive game. Uh, this one's like find 10 differences. So you can put this up on the board. You know, sometimes when they come into class, I don't know if you want a variation of a bell ringer, you could have this up or you could throw this up throughout, you know, at some point in the class and with a partner, they have to see how many they can get. So maybe you're going to leave this up for one minute and then they have to quickly find any differences they can find in it. Sometimes they're harder. Okay. So I say, you know, I can see the tail difference, you know, certain things. So you're looking for all the little variations. Oh, a different color there, different color there. So the kids would be trying to find all that they can for differences. So these are also all over Pinterest to say, find the differences. There's also tons of videos on YouTube where they are, they're happening too. Here is another one on YouTube uh, where the puzzle only gives them a certain amount of time. They have to count how many they can get. I think there's like, there's like 10 puzzles. So there's like 10 puzzles on this thing. So you could just do like one a day. So there's the puzzle. I can pause it if my students need more think time. Some classes definitely do. Um, now the kids have to figure out the differences and then they go and they count. So two, four, six, okay. They gotta find at least one difference. Sometimes you really do have to look for a bit, um, but the you're gonna have a variety of things that they're trying to find. So there's an example of that one on YouTube. I found that one on YouTube. Um, the old oh. pyramid. Yes, Crystal. Oh, there's a question um, in the chat. Where to get this kind of difference pictures? Sure. The find the difference. So if you just search find the difference, um, you'll find Pinterest. You'll find images out there. Um, find the difference. And YouTube will also lead to tons of YouTube videos that are already ready made. What's cool about the YouTube videos in particular is they already have a timer on them. So you don't even have to watch the clock. Like they get 60 seconds to find it. And, uh, you know, they enjoy that type of stress, I guess. It's a little bit stressful for, for some of them, but some of them like it because like competitive, can I find it and that type of thing. And then it shows where it is, of course, after too in the, in the YouTube videos. So sometimes the YouTube videos are my go-to because I don't have to man the clock and I don't have to show everybody where it was. It'll put the big white circle around where it was. So the kids are all like, oh, that's where it was. You know, I didn't find it. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes I play um, the old uh, pyramid game. So this one is a category game. So like, for example, like things in a kitchen, things with wheels, medical jobs, fruits, you have some type of category. So the kids just get the clues and then they have to guess the actual category. So uh, like this one would be like hats and mittens, coats. I apologize, someone's at the door if you hear my dog. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so hats and mittens, Coat, ski pants, and boots, for example. And then if you guessed right, that would be like things for skiing or things for the winter, it depends on your category. A tent, a bed, a couch, a hotel. And then that would be like places you sleep. So you kind of get the hang of it and you completely do this game in the target language as long as your students have some of the basic vocab. You might have to modify it, but sometimes even for the kids, if you were teaching um, like the grammar concepts, you could be like adjectives, verbs, and maybe they just have to know it's an adjective, it's a verb, it's a noun. If you wanna go real simple or you can go a little more complex. Dog, snakes, birds, fish, cat, rabbit. That'd be like common pets, things like that. Things people have as pets. And then I also enjoy um, word games personally. 
It's hard to find them in the target language in a way our students would understand. I'll be honest for a word game. So I don't use these a ton, but I will use these sometimes. Uh, so like that's three strikes you're out there. And then there's tons of ideas on that website right here. So if you go in here, there's just like, and they have the answers. So you could also just send the kids here for a day and have them try to see what they can answer, right? So that was spring, summer, autumn, winter, a man for all seasons. That would have been hard for our kids because uh, I don't know that one either. But this one would be like balancing the budget, a balanced budget. So those type of things. So you can find lots of ideas on that website for the word games. That's good um, for kids just kind of to get them thinking for a second. Here's the balanced budget one. This one is, you know, obviously, you know, you'd have to read the room. If you have a group of uh, heritage speakers, they may not be as good at this, but it's guess the logo. So they're going to give you two logos. and They have to know which logo is right. And you think you know your logos, but I'll be honest, once it gets going and they look alike, it's kind of tricky. So I'll just show you, like, so you have to, so they have to know this logo and they get a timer, right? I'm sure they're all going to get that one. Um, but there are some trickier ones as it goes. Like, I don't know if they'd know Rolex or NASA, Domino's Pizza, right? They, they may not actually uh, know the Windows one because they don't use it as much. But those type of things would be, um, you know, it's kind of fun to guess the logos. There are ones too where they have two. Um, there's some other YouTube videos out there where they show two. One that's correct and one that's wrong, just slightly wrong, and they have to figure out the difference. So that can be fun for them. These are kind of tricky puzzles. I don't know if anyone's ever tried these before. They actually have words in them. So you have to find the words. I, I didn't find any in the target language, but like, I don't know if you can see her, the word story is written here. And so, and then like these different words, so you have to find them. That's the word novel. That's the word page. So you had, you kind of have like a search and they have to find the words. I mean, I guess we could maybe, maybe insert some letters for Spanish, but probably realistically it might just be an English activity where they find the different words that they can. So you'd put it up for like a minute or two and be like, how many words can you find? And they can have fun trying to figure that out. Okay, this one is like I was saying, some of the YouTube videos already are made. So this one's like, you get this picture and you have to find the pencil. It's pretty tricky. So the pencil's right here. I don't know if anybody can see it, but there's the actual pencil. Like these all look like pencils, don't they? Like with the end, but it's not the pencil. It's right there. So like they have a bunch of hidden things in there. So they're like eye puzzles and riddles. So that's another search you can do. Eye puzzles, riddles. Those can be searches on Pinterest, images for Google. That's where I find a lot of my ideas and inspiration for this stuff. All right. This one I call cultural guess who. So I put a bunch of pictures up from my culture of what I'm, whatever I'm teaching. So here's a Spanish related one. Now I don't really give the kids any explanation. And then I put them with their partners and then say, you know, how do you, why do you think these are connected to Spanish culture? Can you figure it out? And then they're not going to get all of them, but they'll start like jotting and talking together and trying to figure out what they can get. Like, oh yeah, those, uh, those women, they dance and they hold those. I think they make a clickety clack, right? And they'll write down the ideas. So then in the end, it's kind of like this, you have a whole conversation about it after the kids kind of brainstorm who they think these people are, what, where the, where this is from, like, you know, they probably are like, oh yeah, that's, I mean, this is, I'm talking from a teenage point of view, but like, oh yeah, the lady with the unibrow, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what they'll remember. Uh, but then, you know, so then when it comes time to like actually talk about it, you can go into detail about like, oh yeah, this is a sombrero, this is, how, this is the meaning of it. And do you guys know that there's more than one color cape for the bullfighting and this is a dish? Does anyone know what's in it? And then you kind of get the class talking about your culture. So that one can be kind of fun. So there was a Spanish example. Here's a French example I did. So this would kind of get your kids talking about different things. Like they probably don't know asterisks, but it'd be fun to talk about. They All the kids believe that every French person wears a beret, which those of us that actually teach French know that's not quite true. It's stereotypically French, but it's not really like everybody's wearing a beret. So then you can talk about it, talk about, you know, like the Mona Lisa and the different things. All right. So those are kind of like some cultural twists, 
so you can get that conversation going. And it's kind of, it's student led with their ideas, like of what they think it is. And if there's one they don't know at all, it's a great time to introduce it. This is a personality test one. So like they are, they have to look at like objects and decide what they see. Like, did you see the tree or the elephant first? So if you saw the tree first, like, you know, it'll tell you your personality traits. If you saw the elephant first, these are your personality traits. So that one's kind of interesting. Um, there's this one. There's also an activity. I wasn't able to find it. It's on Teachers Pay Teachers and it's free. There's one where you draw a tree and the way you draw the tree is your personality. So if you made like a big trunk, there's certain traits. If you made a skinny trunk, there's certain traits, things like that. So you can kind of like have, let them have fun with their testing their personality. So like, I, I would say if I can get it to the, like, so this is called all is vanity. And then it's like, they'll have you look at it and decide what you see first. So if you see this, you're a rebel. If you see something else, you're different. So this one's um, also a, the, what do you see first? Another type of variation to find out what your personality is like. I do wish I had audio, I apologize, that's not, I couldn't get the, but here is like, it's beyond brain, the, here. So there's, let's count, let's see if I hopefully can make that ad strip go away, if I, maybe. I wanted, to, I wanted to show you like pause it so you could count the animals. So here's like, how many animals can you see? And then like, it determines like how, um, how much you pay attention to details, how many animals you find. So the kids can count. So like, I mean, you can see we got a shark here, got a turtle there. I mean, if they really pay attention, a fish, gator, donkey, bird, there's quite a few. Um, and then it tells them about their personality. So I get to, okay, so there's some of the, those are some of the animals inside the elephant. It's really pay attention. So if they got one to three, creatures they are and then seven and nine it just tells them what what their personality traits are supposedly so it's kind of interesting they enjoy like it's kind of like a horoscope i guess in a sense about the personality um that one's tiktok dances so it's up to you i mean it, you don't have to be comfortable with it you know they're doing them anyway <laughs> so you can um they're tutorials for some basic tiktok dancing so this guy goes uh very slow um let me see so he, I mean, you'd have to be cool with them dancing like this, obviously, but it is for some teachers, um, things that the kids enjoy. So you can do that. You could also, of course, put a target language dance on, but the TikTok dances tend to be very popular with, at least with the teenagers. So it kind of, he goes through the tutorial to teach them how to tick, do the TikTok dances. Um, this one's kind of a fun activity. So I go to America's Funny Home videos and then I play the video. And I pause right before they get hurt. And then I make the kids guess what body part's going to get hurt. And then this target language. So if you want to teach the kids how to say, my arm hurts, my back hurts, right? My nose is broken, something like that. So you teach them all that vocab. And then you basically, so I would push play. And I had, so you see, I, I didn't pause in time. But so you have to, let me try the next one. So what part do we think is going to get hurt? You know, then you guess which body parts you think are getting hurt. And then there you go. The kids like it. They enjoy watching, of course. And then they see if they're right. Good way to practice your um, body um, part vocab and like it hurts and stuff too. This one's called a partner swap drawing. So partner A will draw a picture. And then we'll like pass them around the room and I'll take them all. Just, they only can draw half their picture. It doesn't have to be a person. It could be any object. Then I mix them up and then I pass them out randomly. And the other person has to finish the drawing. So it can be kind of fun. You can find them printed. Like these are actually on the internet. If you'd rather give them a half done, one already done, that's another option. But it's supposed to be good for like the right brain, left brain thinking that they're finishing the half, that they have to see the connection. So that can kind of be a fun brain break too. And of course, uh, I, you know, I don't know about you. I'm not that artistic, so I'm sure mine would look pretty funny on this side, but they have fun trying to do that. Uh, some of you may have pay, played this game before. You probably have played the heads up game. 
um, which is available at five below. There is actually a travel version for only $5. You can get all the headsets if you want to hit up five below to get the actual um, one for the head. But I just use post-it notes or index cards and tape. So what I'll have the kids do is um, I will have them all write on index cards, celebrities of their choice or famous characters, anything like that, like Tweety Bird, Mickey Mouse, whoever they want. I mix them all up. I collect all of them. I have them each write like five down. Then I mix them all up and then I use their, their list to put them on people. Sometimes I pull them because I have no idea who it is personally, but generally I'll put them on their backs and then have them go around the room, ask yes or no questions, figure out who they are. Like in Spanish or French, they could be like, am I alive? Am I uh, an animal? Do uh, Am I a male? Am I a female? That type of thing. So I can try to narrow it down. Do I have long hair? Oh, am I bald? Oh, okay. You know, like that type of yes, no. But you can go beyond that too and like use objects. Uh, you could do monuments, food items. If you're studying like clothing, it could be clothing objects. So I could be going around like, do I get worn in the winter? Hmm. Am I, can I be, have short sleeves or long sleeves? Those type of things. And then they kind of go around until they figure it out. So they can mingle throughout the room and ask multiple questions or they can just find one partner and ask the questions. So that one's kind of a fun one. Um, you can reuse the index cards if you use index cards and save them, like shuffle them back together. That's the party mixer. And sometimes uh, they sometimes they guess it quite quickly and other times it takes a while. This one's guess the song. So it's sort of like charades meets, uh, you know, name that tune. So students are going to form small groups. And then they have to act out a title of the song to the others to guess it. So you may want to have like a list of songs or a list of people. But like, for example, if I fell, you know, the kids would all fall. It was the song Wipeout or Baby Baby. And they pretended to rock a baby in their hands to get people to guess it or shake it off. And then you see them shaking their booty. So you could do that kind of with a guess the song. They may have to have uh, like a list. So you may have to pick like a list so that just so it's kind of fine tuned. Then there's also like, I don't know if any of you guys participate in March Music Madness. If you're a French and Spanish teacher, you probably do. I don't know if it's available in other languages, but basically they take song titles. If you're not familiar with it, it's um, Senor Aspi is in charge of the Spanish. It's all on Facebook um, under La Cura de Marzo. There's also one in, I think, October. I don't participate in the October one, but my school does a big uh, March one. Then the French is mainly musical. But if anyone who doesn't have it, basically they, they pick like 12 songs from the target language culture. And the kids have to listen and vote every week to eliminate them, similar to the March Madness of basketball. So they're eliminating one by one till they get to the finalists. So the kids do activities to learn them. So that could be really good because the kids already have a list of 12 songs. So now they have to act out the song so the kids can guess the song with the titles. Um, you could have, play the actual song and have them guess the song if you want to do a brain break that way too, like if you picked popular songs. Uh, you do have a lot of kids though. I, I find in my classroom, there's some kids who only listen to pop, some only country. So that could be a little tricky, but the, the March Madness, it's all just that 12 possibilities. You could guess the movie and students act out movie titles. You might want to give them, like I said, a list ahead of time. Or students act out the brand or slogan. So next time, if you get a magazine or contact your library, my library had a bunch they were going to throw away. So I take all the old magazines and then just take the brand names, cut them out, and make like a Ziploc baggie of brand names. So like today I pulled Colgate. Now I have to make a quick me and my partner have five minutes to make a quick slogan for Colgate toothpaste. Or I pulled out, I don't know, Maybelline mascara. Okay, we have to, so like if you just cut out the brand names and throw them in a Ziploc baggie, the kids can draw from them. And then they have to act out the brand or the slogan to try to get people to, to buy their product, like a mini activity. This one's the hidden pictures games. So I found this uh, cool website that had it, but I, to be honest, I was playing with it last night. I wasn't able to get it to work. So I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or if I had to download it. But um, the picture is behind all these squares. And then the picture's revealed one piece at a time. 
So the kids can be like maybe answering trivia questions or in a block to take off to try to guess the object. Or you could have two teams competing. Like I just like name that tune for those that remember that game. Like I can name that song in four. I can name that song in five clues. So maybe I would get five boxes and then the one team, whatever team gives up, they're like, okay, go ahead, prove it. So let's say the person said they could say it in two and the student gets to pick their two blocks. So then they remove two blocks, hoping they can figure it out. But they, it did look neat. I'll take you to the site just to show you, but they supposedly like, this is how it's supposed to work. And I'm not sure why it wasn't working, but there are other sites out there, but this one does not. But basically one by one, it reveals the picture. So that would be like the wolf. And it looked really promising. It supposedly had all of these categories already ready made, which was a lot of stuff that I know I teach at the lower levels um, and some of it at the higher levels, to be honest. But when I go in, I was unable to actually use it the same way for some reason. So either you can play with it and maybe let me know. Please let, reach out to me if you can figure out my error. Or you can look up. It's um, Hidden Pictures PowerPoint Games. There's some ready-made. There are ways to make your own. This one, I think, though, if all else fails, you can take the blank template and download that and make your own, too. So that's kind of a neat activity. I have played a game like this before. The students do really like it because um, they have to guess and they have to wait for the blocks to reveal. So that can be fun. This one is the city guesser or the world guesser. I'm personally not that great at it, but I'll show you it. So you click on it and you, so there's a worldwide, a USA, a Europe or the monuments. I'm gonna try the monuments. So if I go in here, it shows you. So then you have to guess, then you have to guess a place like, I, I was so that was Kentucky I was way off but you have to like look at a place and it just kind of really takes you to a pin you look around and try to figure it out the European cities is kind of fun uh for those of us that teach European stuff uh the USA one can be fun as well if they can figure out the markers but with the European one I like because I can see the languages of the, the names it gives me a little more of a hint uh, but you have to try to see how far off you are. So that one's kind of fun, the virtual vacation guesser. Uh, this is like the idea of creative designs and partner challenges. This is for your creative kids. Um, and you can take these to the next level. These don't have to just be creations. I don't know if any of you do one word images, uh, like the CI technique. But if you do those, this is like that, but individualized. And then the kids can make a full story out of it. So you're going to it can be some simple materials like Play-Doh, aluminum foil, toothpicks, marshmallow, paper markers, craft materials, tissue paper, origami paper, etc. So you're going to give them time work to create their best item. So like, for example, a food, a paper airplane, clothing, a person, the pyramid, the Eiffel Tower, an animal, baby, an alien. And another teacher can judge it later, or you can again use it as an extension writing activity. And that's the part where I add the target language in to make sure I'm getting to that writing part. So I'm sure some of you have seen this. This was like for a French class. They're trying to make the Eiffel Tower. They use the toothpicks and the marshmallows. It's kind of messy to be honest, but it's fun for a day, especially a day before a holiday or something. That can be a fun brain break. Here was a cardboard pyramid of Chichen Itza I found that somebody else did. That looks a little fancy, a little more time consuming, but of course you could go more simple and go with the toothpicks and marshmallows too and have them create their best pyramid or something more simplistic. Uh, these are Play-Doh babies. So I thought these would be really fun. Uh, so I just buy, so if you go to Walmart, they have the party packs. And so if you buy 15 packs, about $10, I get the teeny tiny Play-Dohs. And then you give the kids the Play-Doh and they have to design a baby. And this baby, we could go really far with this baby. We could have them make a birth certificate, uh, maybe a baby book. You know, you could, you could definitely pull the target language into it. So they create their little creature and then they have to write about this creature. So there's a Play-Doh baby. These are Play-Doh aliens. You know, you could definitely get them very creative. Maybe you can have them using the future tense about the future alien visitors coming to the earth and talking about like how this can happen. They do love this kind of creative stuff. Uh, they love it. Uh, even my older kids, I have all I can do sometimes to get the Play-Doh out of their hands. They're disappointed when I take it. So this kind of stuff could be fun. And it just takes a few minutes. And again, I use my kitchen timer. I give them like five minutes to design it. 
and that's that. And they created their person. We they often, if you want to reuse the Play-Doh, I I'm kind of cheap. I, I keep the same Play-Doh. I reuse it. I have, let them take a picture of it. And then they upload their little picture to like Google Classroom and then they can write about it and then they kind of remember their creature. Uh, here is like a cup stack challenge. You don't, you could use like Dixie cups, uh, the, or the red solo cup type ones. And they basically could do the stack challenge. You could have them do a teamwork. This is um, an aluminum foil. When I was a Girl Scout as a kid, I got to do this and I really love this activity. You can also use toilet paper. Toilet paper is probably a lot less expensive. And uh, basically you would just like, you give them a roll of toilet paper and now they have to design fashion. One of them is the model. So uh, with a partner or two groups, they have to create fashion and they have to describe what their partner's wearing. So you give them like five, 10 minutes, they're gonna design the creation. They wrap their partner up with aluminum foil or whatever. And then now they have to describe in the target language what their partner is wearing, what accessories, right? So they make a wild outfit. So they just have a few minutes. That's the beauty of it. It's kind of supposed to look ugly, but they have a real fun time trying. Uh, I don't know if anybody in, in my, any of my French teachers out there celebrate St. Catherine's Day. It's a fun day uh, where they make funny hats. Uh, so they have to make them out of random objects and things like that. So this would be kind of a fun one to have the kids create actually outside of class um, and then bring in uh, for the day. And you don't have to be a French teacher to do this. Honestly, you could do crazy hat day for a brain break. But I have done this uh, for a few years. My kids really like it. Uh, so you tell them ahead of time the criteria and then there's a day they're all going to bring them in and make sure you take lots of pictures. It's a great recruitment tool. These crazy things that I do are great recruitment tools. People want to be in my class. They're requesting to come in. They think it's fun. You know, it's a little quirky, but that's kids like quirky. Let's be honest. Uh, they don't want to be in the class where people are just sitting there talking forever. So St. Catherine's Day can be kind of fun. And again, it's a brain break just because now they're showing off their hats. That's the brain break in class. Put them to work outside of class for this one. It'll take too much class time. It's not really a brain break, but it's class challenge and everyone's going to come in funny. Uh, this one I found on the Jimmy Fallon show. So it's called Box of Lies. So basically, because you don't have audio, so you these are boxes. So you'd have some shoe boxes, just throw some shoe boxes. And inside the shoe box, you'll have a picture of something wild. And then what happens is one partner, so he is going to tell him, he's going to open the box. Jimmy's going to see the box. And now Jimmy has to decide how to describe it to him so he describes it to him and he has to decide whether he's telling the truth or not so in this let me see if i can just get to the video so he opens his box and here's what he finds so it's a bunch of dwarfs doing yoga and he tells jimmy that it's dwarfs doing yoga and jimmy has to decide whether he's telling the truth or not so jimmy's like no it's a lie but you can see actually it was the truth um, but I'm, I wouldn't go this elaborate that I actually have this much cool stuff in my shoe box. I just have a picture. So just find some goofy pictures off the internet of some type of scene. You print them off, put them in the boxes, and then the kids have to say to the partner what's going on in it. It could be in the target language. And then the partner decides whether or not it's true. For example, I don't know, uh, bananas dancing. So there's bananas dancing, this, the partner says, and then the partner has to decide whether they think it's true or false. So you kind of are reading more of the tells of whether they're lying. That's the fun of it. So if you don't want to invest in shoe boxes, paper lunch bags are pretty cheap. You know, buy a hundred, it'll get you by for quite a bit. So that was kind of neat, I thought. Circumlocution challenge. This one, you choose random objects and kind of going back to like that bingo, but you have the kids have one minute to describe it and they have to guess. So there are some very cool random object generator websites. So this would be how it would work. So I would go in, I'm gonna click. Okay, I now have to describe to my partner a squirt gun. And then my partner will have to describe a wrench to me. So this is kind of cool because it has all those weird ones out there for you on the random object generator. So you can have like, so when it's my turn, I click wrench. So you, ever, you send everyone to this website basically and they have it on their separate computer setup, sort of like battleship. So they're looking at each other with separate computers and then they have to push the button. They really hate it. They could push it again, obviously, because like some things they may not know, a pair of dice. So you see, you can get some really creative circumlocution training out of your kids with these type of sites. 
This one is another one, also just as a random object. So you just generate tons of ideas. Uh, this one is random lists of things. So you, this is kind of cool for storytelling. So you, this is the random list, and then I now have to tell a story and include all five of those items in it. So my partner and I might sit together and have to create, okay? So I was watching TV, eating Chinese food when soy sauce went all over me. So I decided to paint the rest of my shirt black with a black Sharpie. And unfortunately it did not work out. So I had to call Superman to come in and save the day. And then Superman said, uh, let's go to Mexico because we need to practice our Spanish more. <laughs> you know, I don't know, some kind of silly story. So it allows a list and you can have the kids like work with a team, push the button. And now they have five objects to have to go write about. So that could be kind of fun in its own sense too. This one's name 10. I don't know if any of you are TikTok fans. This was a huge thing. We had to put, to put a figure down if you've done these things. So if you guys will play with me just for a minute. So I'm going to play the teacher edition. So if you put your fingers up, you can put them down one by one. So never have I ever challenged basically. And there's a bunch of kid friendly ones right there for you if you want more ideas. And here we go. So have you ever been to a boring workshop? Put a finger down if you have. <laughs> You've had a student puke in your class? Put a finger down. <laughs> you have seen a student make a TikTok? Put a finger down. If you have uh, lost a student's homework, put a finger down. Yep. <laughs> You've forgotten a student's name? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you fell during class once? Yes. You have wore two different shoes to work? I've never done that one. You have seen a student texting? Oh, never. <laughs> you have one teacher bestie? And you have been called mom or dad by a student. You know, just kind of fun. So you come up with a fun thing and then the kids are into it. And like, it's all in good fun. But the page before has very kid-friendly ones. On TikTok, they're kind of naughty with them. I don't recommend those. But these are very kid-friendly ones all, all ready to go on those websites. Okay, this one was kind of neat. It's a drawing activity. So you line up, you have a paper on the wall. And then this kid is drawing, but this kid's drawing something on his back. So whatever this kid draws on his back, he's trying to recreate. So I'll just show you for a second. So he draws and his partner draws, trying to be the same. They're gonna see how close they can be. And obviously then you can have three, they have three people. So you can have more if you wanted, but obviously it doesn't come out perfect. That's kind of the fun in it. Um, this is the garbage bag tarp challenge. So I've done this before. Um, so if you, if you're just want to be cheap, just big, get a big garbage bag. So basically the whole class has to sit, has to somehow be on that tarp for 30 seconds. They have to work together to figure out how they can all be on a tarp for 30 seconds. So I use just a garbage bag and in the end, the kids all like, I kind of had to lean in and like huddle just long enough so we can make it 30 seconds. So that's kind of just an easy class challenge, but the more you get the kids working together, um, the more you're going to see classroom community and you're also going to be able to um, expand. Now, at the beginning of the year, by the way, the kids aren't willing to do this kind of stuff. You kind of break them in slowly because this one requires a little bit of touch. And I know touch isn't everybody's love language, but it does require some touch. But the kids do get comfortable the more that they're doing all these other brain breaks and classroom challenges. I did this yesterday um, in class. I've done it a couple times before. It was a lot of fun. So I just set a timer. I gave the kids each a computer piece of paper. I surprised them. I just said, make your best paper airplane go. And we're going to race in two minutes. They had two minutes to make a, a paper airplane. Sadly, the amount of kids who had no clue how to make a paper airplane was really apparent. So I think, uh, you know, I might need to give a YouTube tutorial in the future, but maybe a short tutorial before. But um, the kids had two minutes and then we launched them from, we lined up in a line on one side of the room. I had them write their initials on the planes. And then I gave prizes for the kids who went the furthest. And then I also gave a red lantern prize, which French teachers uh, probably are aware that in one of the races for Tour de France, the person who comes in last uh, gets like a $5,000 prize called the red lantern prize. So the kid who came in last got a little prize too. Um, you can also make a challenge board. You just take a, a big piece of poster board, put some holes in it. And you could have, you could put point totals on the holes if you wanted, if you wanted to add an element to it. So it's just a quick activity, but a lot of smiles, a lot of kids stick their paper airplanes home as, as souvenirs. Uh, photo scavenger hunts are a lot of fun. So 
you sometimes have to have these set up. Like if you have outdoor space at your school, oftentimes it's got to be outdoor space. If you don't, you can have the kids maybe partner up if you give a long enough notice, like you're going to have a week to get this done. So then they can kind of get it together with a partner or they can do it by themselves. So here's like they go out and they find a picture and they try to put a picture of a relaxing place, the biggest tree. If you have kids who don't get out at all, there's also the internet where they can find, um, you know, different things to take pictures of. So they could go on the internet and take a picture of a relaxing place. They could find a big tree, whatever they need to do to participate. Um, so you can get kind of creative, but it's a lot of fun uh, to do one of these. I did this on my honeymoon for Carnival Cruise. I got to do one and I really enjoyed it. So I have done this a couple of times with my kids. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so they just go out and find stuff. If you can walk around your school, if you have a little outdoors, there's some outdoor ones um, or even in the building, potentially, if you can somehow monitor them. Uh, this was a French one where at home they go find objects and take it. So it could be like a, a little fun homework assignment or even an extra credit. You'd be surprised some of the fun extra credit they'll be glad to do. This was a gratitude scavenger hunt, which I thought couldn't hurt. Our students are sometimes we get to know a little more about our students too. Like they take a picture of their favorite color, something that feels safe, something that smells good. So like you're learning a lot about your kids if they share this with you. This is a Spanish version, selfies at the house. So while they're home in uh, the next week, you know, I want to see you taking pictures of someone shutting your, the arm, armoire door, or I want to see you taking water from the kitchen, something like that. So it kind of requires them to like learn the target language and take a fun picture and, sh and you could share them if they're willing. This one, sometimes I just randomly assign the kids to get together with groups. And then I say, find three things you have in common. You have two minutes, go. And as quick as they can, they're trying to like, do you have a dog? And they learn lots about each other. So I kind of call it the, the twin activities. Here is the trivia challenge. So how many of you have been to a trivia night? Do I have some people who have been to one of those trivia nights? Okay. Well, they're a lot of fun. I did one for a fundraiser one year for a French club, and I kind of got into do, using it for the classroom too. So you group your kids into teams, and you're going to ask them just 10 questions, and they have to collaborate to answer. And then you don't go over the answers to the very end. So it can be a lot of fun for the kids. So here's just, uh, they can't use their phones or Google for answers. The teams have to collaborate before writing down the answers and pencils down once the once the question is called. So here, I'm gonna have named that movie just because I made it not, not target language, but you could certainly have it be target language. I did a whole intro the first day of school on French culture and Spanish culture to see if the kids knew where it was spoken, what foods were popular there. And it was a lot of fun. All right, so question one, we're not in Kansas anymore. So you'd be guessing the movie for that one, All right? So that one is The Wizard of Oz. You had me at hello. And that is Jerry Maguire. So like this, like you get the kids thinking, here's Johnny. So my older people will know that one, The Shining. My young kids, the young kids here may not, but that's okay. Why so serious? So that is, I think, Batman, the Dark Knight, I think. I feel the need, the need for speed, right? So like, just kind of have fun. There's no crying in baseball. So these are just examples. There was like a bonus. So sometimes I do a bonus where they have to do a bonding activity, so to speak. So I've done bonuses where they have to tell me who was went the furthest uh, over the summer. Or I did a bonding activity where they had to, this one was kind of a little bit out of their comfort zone. But I said they can't break school dress code, but whoever in their group's wearing the most items wins. So the kids will start taking off anything extra they have and throwing it on their partners to win. So you give them like three minutes to set up. So like you can use it as bonding as well. And then that was Wizard of Oz, Jerry Maguire, The Shining, Batman, Dark Knight, Top Gun, and bonus was League of Their Own. That was just a quick example. But you can use those trivia games too. Um, they can be review games. They can be cultural. They can be uh, target language games. They don't take much time. You just set up the slides, give them a sheet, one, have them number one through 10. Do give them a team name. I usually make the kids do a team name. Sometimes I make them do a team chant where they can cheer for each other um, as well. Just have a little bonding going on. This one, I don't know if anybody ever bought this. My children own this game, so I got inspired by it, but it's don't step in poop. So I use Play-Doh, but you could just use crumpled balls of paper as well. So you just take crumpled balls of paper, you blindfold one kid, you throw the crumpled balls of paper all over. Usually it's just easier paper. And then they have to, partners have to give good directions in the target language so they avoid stepping on the landmines. 
You could use the Play-Doh too if you really like it, but I found that I don't have to clean up anything if I just use the crumpled paper balls. So that's what I do. And I have one batch. I just throw it in, in the cupboard and I reuse it every year, this big ball of crumpled papers. So uh, the in the blindfolds, you can find these really cute. I found these really cute animal print ones. So my kids are like dog eyes and cat eyes. They were from the Ellen show. I got inspired, but it makes it a little more fun too. And the better they learn, they have to be really good at directions. This one's put the vocab words. Uh, so this is kind of like a, it's a challenge where the kids pick up the cup. You probably have seen it. So they pick up a cup and they try to get a prize. So you could also, I was thinking you could put flashcards in here. So if you had flashcards under the cups, they pick, they go up, they pick up the cup for their team. Now their team has to answer that flashcard. So we could kind of like make a variation of, of the game. Uh, this one is like a money scoop challenge. So I thought you could either divide the class into two teams, either use fake money or use vocab cards. I thought that might be kind of fun. So you could have vocab cards up there and the students have to scoop it. So like this kid has a spatula and, and he has to try to get that onto the tray. And uh, you could use clues about a country. Like maybe our topic is, I want you to guess what, what Spanish speaking country I'm thinking of today. So it's Venezuela. So every card you get is gonna give you a better clue towards guessing. So you're competing with your team for the most clues and they each are getting separate clues. Or I could have one group being like house and home vocab, one group being food vocab. So I wanna get as many house and home vocab I can, not the food. So you can turn it into a lot of things uh, with flashcards. Uh, this one is a tic-tac-toe board. You don't need this fancy tic-tac-toe board. Just use a poster board and a chart and you can have the kids have X's, just have little X's and O's on index cards, but like they bottle flip they have to bottle flip and get it right to put their tic-tac-toe down. And they line up and just try to do it quickly. This one is another bottle flipping game. So that you make like a ladder on like a poster board and throw it on a desk. So the two of them are competing to bottle flip. So every time they bottle flip, they can move it against them. They're trying to get it to be on the other end so they win. So that kind of just bottle flipping because it just seems like kids still like to bottle flip. Um, this one's sticker sleuth. So when the kids enter, I give them each three stickers and their job is just to discreetly put them on three different people without them knowing. So if they get caught, the person gets to put the sticker on them. So you want to leave without having any stickers on you in theory, but you're trying to like put stickers on each other. It's kind of a little bit of a, uh, like uh, April fish day for the French Poisson d'Avril. And uh, they like to be sneaky and put those stickers all over. They're often on my back, but that's okay. I know they're doing it, but I let them do it anyway. <laughs> this is a communication gone wrong game. So like the first person has to do an action and the second person has to try to imitate it. And it goes all the way to, it's like the telephone game with action. So it continues going. So... So he's going to look at his clue, decide what he has to do. And then this person has to do whatever he does. Then she has to tap. They have to do it. So by the end, it's nothing like it started as. It's, kind, it's pretty fun. And you can do two lines just to keep it moving. This one's called electricity. So you put an object in the middle and line them all up. And then you squeeze their hands. The so the, the teacher is holding the two hands of the two teams and you squeeze both their hands at the same time and they have to squeeze all the partners to be the fastest to pick up the object. So let's see. Here's the quick game. Let's see if I get to it quick. Okay. So he squeezes and then they have to quickly try to get the item right there. So then they quickly grab the object. So that part, that team gets the point because they grab the object first. So they have to feel the pulse going down the group. So it's called electricity, kind of a fun one. And, you know, they put a, a cool donkey, but, you know, you can put a cute donkey if you're a Spanish teacher, put an Eiffel Tower, whatever you want. This one's Guess the Movie. So it's a YouTube video and it goes to your emojis. So this is like Spider-Man. So you can guess all the different ones. Lots of ideas there. I'm going to make sure I get through my presentation. <laughs> 
So this one, I, I'll skip the video. This one's find a movie. So you come in and you have to find movies. So you put this up on the board and the kids have to guess like Star Wars, Mary Poppins. You see there's tons of movies in here. So they can have a lot of fun trying to guess. This one's a song one based on songs like Stairway to Heaven is right there. Yellow Submarine, you know, those type of ideas. This is make as many words as you can from the letters below. I found most of these on Pinterest. This is name a song with dates in their title. So like they have to, you know, come up with a date in their title. Name a song with a color in the title. Can you find the missing number? These are more mathematical. A seven segment puzzle. Find five mistakes. This is a celebrity character fun. So like celebrity, their character drawings, you have to guess a celebrity, but the character drawings are pretty funny. Uh, this is an Ellen DeGeneres game I really like. This is where I got the masks. So you see, I have masks like these. They, I love them. They're actually very funny. So one person has to like touch. In this case, they can't touch, but I would let them like touch the object, describe it, and the other person has to guess it. So like one person's blindfolded and they feel something. Let's say I'm feeling, I don't know, a bottle of glue. So then I describe to my partner in the target language what I'm feeling, and then the partner has to say glue. And that's how I get it right. Um, this one is a cute game from Ellen as well. She, it's, she puts this on the board and this, you might recognize Sofia Vergara, but anyway, she has to act it out and then Ellen has to figure out what she's saying. So coquetier means like to flirt. So she does certain things to show it. This one, uh, my kids were big fans of FGTV. I don't know if any of your kids watch YouTube, but, uh, they did this activity where it's what's in the box. So you just put holes so the rest of the class can see what's in the box, but nobody else can. And then the kid has to reach in and guess. But everybody else in the class gets to see what they're touching, except for the kid. So that one can be fun. And of course, you can make them describe it in the language too. This was, a, it's a free game on Teachers Pay Teacher called Guess the Gibberish Game. It's completely free. So the kids read it. It's kind of like that game. I'm trying to remember. The, there's a game out there. So we got Tisky, right? So then if you, it's we got this guy. So if they read it out loud and say it enough times, they can get the what it's saying. Uh, let us make it a great day, great day. So that's let's make it a great day. So those can be kind of fun. The kids have to read them and figure out what they say. Fortune cookie fun, have all the kids write five predictions down in future tense, throw them all in a basket. The kids are really, really funny. This takes about 10 minutes for them to prepare them. You know, they'll say you're going to die tomorrow, but it's kind of fun. And then the kids draw them from the bag and they love it. They love getting a fortune. Uh, just so you know, I did have one student abstain this year, apparently went against their religion. So if, if somebody is against it, you know, obviously I didn't force them. This one, which one doesn't match? They, you know, give them a minute. They have to figure out what shoe doesn't have a match. Uh, this is a paint, a picture with a bunch of things wrong in it. And you have to figure out what's wrong in it. Uh, guess the subject's name. So these are school subjects and they have these emojis. Guess the cartoon. These are famous people like Nicolas Cage, Kevin Bacon, right? So you have to go through and guess who the celebrity is based on the emojis. Here is a music diary. There's a key for it. So you have to like guess who it is, like the different things. So like this is the doors, you know, I, I think that one's Cinderella. There's some different groups. So the kids may not be that great. This was guess the country's names. Uh, sales pitch. So one of my coworkers does this cool activity. She has the kids go raid their junk drawers and donate objects to her class. She throws them in a bag and uh, the kids have to sell them. They have to sell what they pick up. So maybe I'm going to pick up a, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a paper clip. Now I have to sell it. So like I have to come up with a sales pitch and try to attempt to sell the item. It's kind of neat. Uh, flashcard duels. Take a flashcard set, an old fashioned flashcard set, give half to each partner. So I'm quizzing my partner on my set. He's quizzing me on mine. Every time I get it right, I get to keep a card. So it's kind of like war with flashcards. This one is blurred object guess. So just, just like I showed the blurred celebrity, they're blurred objects and they have to try to guess what the object is. The mannequin challenge. It was really popular several years ago on TikTok where everybody froze and then you take a quick, and then you try to take a quick video of that. Honestly, it's still kind of popular. The kids like doing that. Bubblegum challenge. Sometimes I just give everyone a piece of gum. If you hit up five below, you can get 165 pieces of bubblegum for $5. And you give everyone a piece of gum that day and uh, see who can get the biggest bubble just for fun. Or you can just give them gum, uh, you know, to keep them entertained for a few minutes. 
Okay, so I'm sorry that was so much. I know it was, but I want to give it enough time if anybody had questions or comments. Uh, I hope you at least got some ideas. I know it was a ton of ideas. That's why a, a copy of all of this will be very helpful. Oh my, look at the notes. Daniel's got tons of notes. Great. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you work so hard on a Saturday. <laughs> so do you have uh, questions or um, any comments or if you have uh, other ideas, just let me know. No, these are great. These are all the ideas I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're like, this is like a lot of fun. The kids really like all these activities. It's not uh, not for the faint at heart, some of the ones, but I think most of these are pretty easy to implement. That's why I think it's good for any teacher. Like if you're an introvert, you can still do this stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I can see how uh, it can be used in different units that um in a different unit and at the same time, you know, students are learning, use the language and also have fun. And I want to be in your French class <laughs> <laughs> to make the, you know, the ugly hat. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It, it's a fun activity. Yeah. It's a lot of ideas. Yeah. You know, this, uh, all the ideas make me really want to go back to classroom, you know, <laughs> and want to try it out. Yeah, you can come visit anytime. So if anyone did have additional questions, I will give you my email if you wanted it or you needed a link or anything like that or something goes, uh, I can definitely refer you to any of that. But I hope you did take something away from today. I know it's a ton of information uh, and uh, I tried to make the 90 minutes, you know, valuable on the Saturday to make sure you got at least something you could walk away and try tomorrow. Any questions? This is awesome. I enjoyed it. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. These are all wonderful ideas. Thank you. It's I try to have some original ideas to make sure we're meeting all those different ideas kids need as well as us. Sometimes I've been to one workshop and I loved it, but it wasn't my personality. I couldn't do a, a half of it. <laughs> it's very geared towards elementary. I didn't have the space in my classroom. So I try to make ones that could adapt to most teachers, like almost everybody. Yeah, everybody's saying thank you. I think we do have questions. We, I think we just need time to explore, to actually try it out in classroom, right? Yes, I mean, just take one. That's what I do. I take one at a time, try it out. And there will be pitfalls. Don't be afraid to just like adjust, just like we do every day. Hmm. Yeah. All right, I think we don't have uh, questions. Them, let's enjoy weekend. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a nice weekend. You too.